Uh, so I think that uh, for, for my remarks today, I'm going to keep it at a, a very, very high level. I'm going to talk at a, a very high level about some of the conversations related to open access and scholarly communications that have been taking place in the United States over the last year, and, and which I think would, will, will resonate with some of the conversations that we've been having here uh, together um, at CORE. But I should say right away that, um, that when it comes to scholarly communications, when it comes to talking about open access and open data, uh, open science, I am an unabashed optimist. Uh, even by American standards, like I, I tend to be an optimist. Other Americans say, Greg, you're, you're way too optimistic. But the fact of the matter is I, I just think that the future, is, the future is open. And I think it's going to take a lot of work. But I just think it's. A, I think that's just. The, that's just. Uh, that's just where we're headed. It's the right thing to do, and it's the right thing for scholarship, and that's that's where we're going. So. I really need to explain my optimism, though, because there, you know, when you look at the, if you're looking at the United States for the last couple of years, there's not a lot of, a lot, not a lot of cause for hope, I think, uh, including in scholarly communications. And I should really qualify why, what gives me optimism, and I think that. The fact of the matter is libraries and archives and publishers and museums are in a revolutionary moment. It's hard to know even what the purpose, we're facing existential crises. And one of the things I tell my staff uh, is that in these um, ambiguous times, uh, it's more important to know what the right questions are and what the right problems are rather than to have answers. And if you can identify what the right questions and right problems are to work on, and you start building the right community, to work on those critical problems, well, that's how you make progress. And I think that over the last year, when I look at the scholarly communications conversation in the United States, we're making progress um, uh, in exactly those ways. We're identifying the core problems and questions that we need to be working on, for one. And we're actually increasing the number of uh, folks and partners that are participating in, 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 in tackling these challenges together. So I'll talk a little bit about how that conversation has been unfolding in the US. And hopefully, I'll leave you uh, convinced that there is cause for, for optimism, especially since uh, when I look at you know, what's happened in Skullcom in the United States um, since we met last year in Venice. I think it really has to start with this. I think the entire conversation in the US over the last uh, year has really been centered around and, um, and, um, uh, and uh, has been motivated by Elsevier's acquire, uh, acquisition of B Press uh, nearly a year ago in August. I think this really changed the entire conversation around IRs and scholarly communications and open access in the United States. Uh, I think that this, there was a very strong reaction that continues to, to unfold in the US. And I think the reason for that is that um, when it comes to IR, uh, institutional repositories, you know, uh, B Press was created you know, through, it was part of the academy-owned infrastructure. Uh, and now it's been purchased by, uh, by a commercial entity that is not seen as being um, sympathetic or, or friendly to our Skullcom uh, open access uh, mission. And so this has been uh, a cause for incredible, uh, incredible alarm. So how could I possibly be optimistic in the, in, the face, in the face of this? And this is why. It really helps us clarify the problem we're working on. Richard Pointer really captures this well when he was talking about this in an article uh, last, uh, last October. And he said, if the research community wants to solve the affordability and accessibility problems, it is first going to have to solve the ownership problem. And I think that when we talk about open access, or we talk about the Skullcom crisis in libraries, oftentimes we talk about, we can't afford these journals. They're expensive, right? How do we, how do we negotiate better? How do we, get more, you know, how do we get more money from the provost so we can purchase more? It's an affordability problem. Or it's an accessibility problem. We may be able to afford you know, access for our users, but how can we stretch license agreements to make more, uh, make, uh, more, more folks able to get uh, the benefits of this gated licensed uh, access to information? I think the acquisition of BPress really brought home the point that the problem isn't affordability and the problem isn't accessibility, as critical as those problems are. Those are just on the surface. The core issue is that we don't own 
we don't own the academy, the nonprofit community doesn't own the infrastructure on which accessibility, discoverability, and stewardship happens. And that's the fundamental issue. And I think that in the United States, that is now very, very, very clear. Now, I think this is something that those of us that have been participating uh, in the institutional repository community, this comes as no secret. But I think that my e-resources librarians, my librarians that are negotiating buying journals every year, my archivists, folks that don't see themselves as part of the institutional repository, movement, this got their attention. It got their attention in ways uh, that, um, that opens up uh, an opportunity to build our coalitions uh, that might, be, might uh, not have existed a year ago. So I'll give a few examples um, that, you know, certain events and conversations that I've been watching with real interest and, and increasing hope uh, over the last year. Now, one took place last, um, last October. Uh, when I talk about the U.S. context, I think it's always necessary to, to, to share um, uh, the, the fact that the United States doesn't have a national library. Uh, oftentimes, people are surprised to know that, but we don't, we don't have a national library. Uh, we have a Library of Congress that's really for Congress, but it's, it's, the scale is such that it sort of almost becomes like a national library, but, but it's not. Um, and we have uh, library consortiums uh, that, that exist, and they become large enough to sort of approximate like the national libraries, but they're not. Uh, and an important group uh, is the, it's, it's from the US Department of Education. It's the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And over the last three years, this government agency has been funding um, an effort to build, the. they're calling it the national platform. So they've been funding a lot of uh, initiatives and projects to build out uh, sort of an institutional repository structure. But they're doing it in a way that I find incredibly exciting. Um, because they're doing it not just with libraries talking about journal content, although they do that, certainly, but they're also talking about archives. They really center archives and archival collections and archivists in all those conversations. It's far beyond uh, scientific journal articles. It, it's that, but it's more. And they also include the museum community in a way that, is, uh, that I think is wholly beneficial, especially when we're talking, as we have been, uh, about not just building uh, open access of repositories, but building a knowledge commons. Uh, and so this, 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 this um, uh, they had a wonderful three-year check-in about their, their, um, their initiative. All of their, um, all of their videos uh, and presentations are available online. And I think that was a really important uh, conversation that we could plug into. Another important conversation was that uh, I was invited to participate in an ARL, that's the Association of Research Libraries in the United States. It's a grouping of about 100, the 130 sort of largest um, uh, academic libraries in the United States. They had an invitation only event on digital humanities. It was a digital humanities event uh, held um, in Denver, Colorado. And I could see what the future library is when we had this conversation. Now, it certainly, it was, it was Jeff Spees was there. And so I know a number of you are familiar with Jeff's work with the Center of Open Science. Um, but he was there, and it was all about digital humanities. And what are the humanities? He was talking about when, how do you, um, when humanists build um, uh, yeah, websites you know, for, their, for their humanistic research, how is that being, um, how is that discovered? and being preserved, and how can we use an institutional repository network to capture these, these digital uh, scholarship uh, outputs? And so here, we had institutional repository, we had technologists, we had liaison librarians, we had digital preservationists, we had archivists, we had the whole library in a way that I think that when we oftentimes talk about SCALCOM uh, in a more narrow way, we, we don't have. And I thought that this actually is sort of the future of, I could see the future library being, you know, from selection and reference and preservation and access services coming alive in this conference in a way that I hadn't seen uh, quite, uh, quite um, uh, previously. And it was exciting. Over the spring, um, I really want to uh, commend uh, Cor and especially uh, Kathleen for really uh, making a, a very uh, concerted and, um, uh, and successful effort uh, to bring that core mission and vision to that distributed uh, environment that I was talking about in the United States. Uh, at the Coalition of Networked uh, Information uh, Conference in, uh, in April, uh, Cor had two presentations about the, the, the future of the, um, of the next generation uh, repository. And Kathleen also organized uh, uh, the Next Generation Repository U.S. Implementation Group that includes a number of institutions, MIT included, but also Texas A&M and University of California, San Diego.
Diego. So really starting to build the community to implement CORE's vision in that United States context. Um, one of the things that I've been looking uh, at with real um, satisfaction is how much I'm hearing about CORE um, when I'm not initiating it. Other, other folks in my, in, my, in my network are talking about CORE and CORE's work. And I think that's a, a sign of great success. And, and I, think that, uh, I think that Kathleen's doing a great job, and, and it, along, with, along with many of you, to get that message out. Uh, I've also been really heartened over the spring to see the partnerships between CORE and Spark and how Spark and the open access community, I see Nick Shockey in the, in the back, uh, really working together to bring this, um, uh, our vision for uh, building a, um, uh, a global uh, knowledge commons uh, together. I think that's been very healthy and that's been something I've been enjoying to see in the US environment. And I want to finish today talking about an event that's happening literally right now. Uh, literally right now, in Chicago. Uh, the Center for Research Libraries in Chicago uh, is hosting an event that I think is probably one of the most exciting collections conversations that I've ever seen. It's a lot like that event I was talking about, that digital humanities event uh, in Denver, uh, but on a wider scale. Uh, the conversation is called um, the New Global Supply Chain for Information. And so what CRL is saying is that um, uh, when you look at the market for information resources, uh, the, digital, the, digital, um, the digital environment has really disrupted libraries, archives, museums, university publishers. So how do we get together, those of us that actually aren't for-profit institutions but are part of the nonprofit, you know, global knowledge commons, how do we get together and work in this new disrupted environment? And when you look at the, um, the, the, the titles of the, the, the talks that are being given, you know, Cliff Lynch, that I know he was here earlier this week, he's giving a talk on digital preservation and archives. Uh, there's folks talking about uh, post-colonial archiving in Latin America. Uh, there's folks talking about data mining in a cloud computing uh, environment. There are folks talking about uh, negotiating and purchasing licensed content from vendors. What's really exciting about this conversation is that if you're an archivist, you're going to look at that and you're going to say, I have to be there. If you're an e-resources librarian that would never think of yourself as an archivist, you're going to look at that event and you're going to say, I have to be there. If you're a repository manager and you don't think of yourself as an archivist or an e-resources librarian or someone from Access Services, you're going to say you have to be there. And this is what I see as a, a, core, um, a core point is that the issue in Scarlet Communications is about building that shared global information commons, the academy-owned infrastructure, and we have to do it together. So I think that um, as uh, the institutional repository community, and CORE's been a leader in here for, for a, you know, nearly a decade now, a sign of success is how, um, a sign of success of course is how many different institutional repositories are we linking up together globally, but another sign of success is how many people within our institutions beyond the, inst the IR managers are now taking an interest in IR issues. Where are the archivists? Where are the museum professionals? Where are our, our university uh, presses? Where are they in that conversation? And I would suggest that as a challenge uh, to all of us, myself included, is that if you're in the room uh, talking about scholarly communications and you don't see an archivist in the room, Ask yourself, is the conversation, would it be improved by having an archivist in the room? And if so, go get, find one. And if, you, if, it, if it would be improved by finding another person, to, so we call this radical collaboration within MIT. Nance McGovern, our digital preservation expert and an archivist, has been really championing this idea of radical communication. When you're in the room, look around the room and try to figure out who's not there and then go rectify it. Go, go bring, that, bring that, uh, that perspective in. Now, I want to um, uh, end, my, uh, end my remarks, but I want to share one idea uh, that I've been thinking about. I, uh, I'm an associate director for collections, and so I spend my time obsessing about collections, uh, from archival collections to the repository collections, all of it. And I think that the, the, the best analogy I've ever heard um, used uh, for collections and describing collections is that collections are like a coral reef. Uh, coral reef, they're, they're vulnerable to attack. They, they can die. But if they're nurtured and cared for and cultivated, a coral reef can become, an, uh, can become uh, the, the, the bedrock of an entire ecosystem that's quite wonderful. And I think of repositories in that way. If CORE can really center repository discussions in a way that brings in museum professionals and archivists and other, uh, other parts of the community, you can actually build this sort of this ecosystem like a, like a coral reef. That's what, that's, what I, that's what I think of. 
Now, Chris Berg is the MIT Libraries Director, and, and I'm very, very proud and honored to work with Chris because she has such a strong commitment to open science and uh, open data and, and open access. But I think that Chris and everyone at MIT were working on the legacy of Ann Wolpert. Ann Wolpert was the longtime library director at MIT when, library, when MIT created, created DSpace. And she passed away in 2013 uh, from cancer. And just before her death, she published this article. And this is what I remind myself when I'm thinking, when I'm thinking that we're facing existential crises and I'm thinking that, uh, oh no, you know, Elsevier bought another part of the community, <laughs> you know, the, the, the academy-owned uh, infrastructure. I, I think of what Anne said. And she said, there's no doubt that the public interest vested in funding agencies, universities, libraries, and authors, together with the power and reach of the internet, have created a compelling and necessary momentum for open access. It won't be easy, and it won't be inexpensive, but it's only a matter of time. We win in the end, all right? It's so honored to be with you. Thank you very much.